So let's just get right in it. Uh, I wish we could have song services. That there's so much that we miss. But I, I think it's a test of our, our faith. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today, a measure of faith. If you'll uh, turn with me to Romans 12 and verse 3, we will begin. Romans 12, verse 3. Breaking into the thought uh, that Paul is giving the Romans here about being a living sacrifice, being holy before God, which is, after all, our reasonable service, he says this in verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think more highly than we ought to think about ourselves, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, in the context, obviously Paul is writing to a church group, uh, a group of people who meet together, who have come to uh, the calling of God, they've been baptized, they've received the Holy Spirit, and they're beginning to understand and learn how to live a Christian life. But I want to go back to Luke 7. And take a look at a situation pre-calling, if we will, if we can say that. Luke 7, and beginning in verse 1. After Jesus had given all the Beatitudes and the, the way that the, the commandments had been given to Moses and, and the interpretation that Jesus gives being quite different than the, the uh, people that had governed down through the hundreds of years that they had been Israel, Jesus begins working in, in, in groups of people. And he starts preaching and, and things start happening. And we see here in verse 1, Luke 7. Now, when he had concluded all of his sayings, which would be all of the, the Beatitudes and the, and the sermon that he gave on the mount, he entered Capernaum, which is a district north of Jerusalem. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when the centurion had heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to plead with him to come and heal his servant. Now, it's interesting to see here, this is a Roman centurion who's in charge of 100 people. Generally, they would have their own home and family there, and they would be invested in the community. In fact, we'll see here uh, what, the, what these elders say in verse 4. When they came to Jesus, these elders, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Now, I had to pause a little bit when I saw that because why would a centurion care about the indigenous people of the land? And the, in my notes down here in the bottom of the Bible, one big thing for him was he was interested in God and by building a synagogue, he kept peace in the community. So that makes me think, then, about the Beatitudes. Did he, was he aware of those? Because one of the concepts of a Beatitude is peacemaker. This gentleman had an attribute or a measure of faith already before he even saw Christ. Now, let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 8. To pick up the rest of the story. Because all those these, these two uh, sets of scripture uh, differ a, a little bit. They do cover the same, uh, the same story. So, when Jesus heard that the minister, or th that the centurion was very interested in him coming down. Look, Notice what the centurion says here to Jesus after Jesus comes to meet him. 
and this, they meet. The centurion said to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. So he knew that he was not a Jew. He knew that he was not clean. He had, he, he had some information here that maybe other people didn't. And, and we'll see how much difference this makes. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word. Now that's a measure of faith, isn't it? Speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I understand being under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go over here. Say to another one, go over there. And he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. He was, you know, if you have a beard, you might be doing this. Wow. And he's thinking to himself in respect to the scribes and the Pharisees and the doubters and the haters and those who didn't want him there in the first place. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west, will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, in other words, he's talking about his own people here, his, the Jewish part of the society in which he lived, will be cast out into utter darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those entitled people who thought they had the truth, who thought they had everything they needed in life, will be turned away. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, because his measure of faith was strong enough, let it be done to you. So we see here then that there may be cause to think that everyone born, no matter where we live, what our environment is, is whether we go to church or not, what church there is to go to, whatever the case might be, it seems then that there's a possibility from this that we see here that every person has a measure of faith. How much that is, we don't know. In this man's case, we don't know if he came to, to repentance or not. I don't know that it matters. His faith brought him to Christ. His faith got his, his servant healed. So I want to segue then into to really what I, I want to talk about. Because if that is the case, if all of us are given a measure of faith and those that accept the call come to Christ, repent, are baptized, and have hands laid on for the Holy Spirit, we can turn to Matthew 25 and see what takes place. Because although this parable is physical in nature, we can pull a spiritual meaning out of it, especially for believers of Christ. Notice in verse 14, Matthew 25, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. He called his servants to him, servants who who we would say are believers, if we want to put this in spiritual terms, and delivered his goods to him. In other words, we've received the Holy Spirit. That's about as good as it gets, I think. And to one he gives five talents, one two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. Now, if we take the view of the centurion and go back into Matthew 5 again and look at it spiritually, what attributes of the the beatitudes might we have had before our calling those attitudes could be called several abilities when the holy spirit is combined with what is in the spirit of man and we realize that we are now children of god how much more can we be benefited by the holy spirit as we learn to grow the little person in us because really, if we stop and think about it, that's what life for us is all about. Growing the little guy up here. Because we're told that the Spirit of God joins with the Spirit of man to prove that we are children of God. You'll turn over to uh, Romans. We can, we can see that. Uh, Romans 8.
Okay, I want to start in verse 5 to set all this up. Romans 8, verse 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So if, if one of the attributes of that centurion was to be a peacemaker because he built that synagogue for them, it also must have rubbed off him on him enough that he would know that Jesus Christ was a healer and a holy man and came to him for the healing of his servant. For us today, as we live in this life, those attributes that we brought to the altar, as it were, to repentance and to baptism, are then magnified by the Holy Spirit to bring us up in the things that we lack so that as we mature, we can be a complete person. Verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are, on the, who are in the flesh cannot please God. The centurion couldn't please God, but he had enough faith that he came to God for help. When we come to God, where were we in our lives? Were we at the high point of our lives? Success? Big job, big money, or were we mostly downtrodden and suffering and the last thing we hoped to do was find peace in our lives and we come to God for it? A lot of us are in that boat, including me. I was at the bottom of the trough when I came to God. That's the last thing I thought about doing because I wanted to live my life my way. I wanted to have the things that I wanted to have. And everything I had, literally everything I had, was removed from me, taken away. Wife, child, house, car, everything disappeared. And I started over from scratch, and I've been blessed much more than I could have thought. Now, let's we'll drop down to verse 12. Therefore, brethren, because all of this is here, because God dwells in us, because we have his spirit, we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to Jesus Christ, obviously. Verse 13, if we live according to the flesh, we will die physically and spiritually, eventually. If we, if we put the, let's see, if, but if by the spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. Now and in the kingdom. And this, this becomes important to us because there's this changeover from a physical life run by a physical person to a life that's clothed in this tent temporarily until the new creature can become a complete spirit being. So if, if it's convoluted, well, okay, fine. Go read Romans 7 and you'll find how Paul dealt with that. For as many, verse 14, as are led by the Spirit of God, these are, emphatically are, right now, sons of God. As we sit in our chairs and our seats, as we watch the TV or whatever, we are literal children of God. That's what Jesus sees. That's what our Father in heaven sees. He doesn't see this physical tent that we're wearing because we have been dumped in whatever body of water we went down in and came up a new creature. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we, we cry out, Daddy. Just like when we were three or four years old, we scuffed our knee and we come running in, crying, tears running down our face, wanting a Band-Aid on our, on our boo-boo. Our Father fixes our boo-boos. He takes care of us because of the little guy up here that's now spirit. The spirit bears witness with the spirit of man that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs to God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer in this life, that we may be glorified together. Now I want to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All of these verses that are being read today and have been read throughout 
this COVID crisis, if we want to call it a crisis, there's nothing new here. We've all read it. But I think we really need to stop and take a moment to understand just who we are today. Because the little guy up here needs to be fed and can't be fed by being embroiled in a physical life. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. And we're jumping in again to the thought here with Paul. And if you want homework, read the whole chapter. Read the whole book. See what the context is. And put yourself in the mind that would have been in, in this time, time frame with these people. Notice verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge it this way, that if one died, and one is capital O-N-E, which means Christ, if Christ died for all, which we know and accept that he did, then all died. Now Christ died, was taken off the cross, the blood had completely gone out of him, his life was gone, he got wrapped up in a, in a burial cloth with spices and put in a cave, and the rock was rolled over the top of it, he was dead. Not asleep, dead, physically. And if that's the case, when we got buried in the water, we died too. In Jesus' eyes, in God's eyes, this died. Totally. What came up was the little guy here. Again, yes, it's still clothed here. Because we have to still live. Let's keep reading. All died, and he died for all that those who should live should live no longer for themselves. Yes, you put a roof over your head if you have a work ethic. You clothe yourself. You take care of your wife and your children. Transportation has to be driven. If the, if the money is good enough, you're able to buy a, a reasonably decent vehicle to drive. All of that takes place, yes, because we still live in this physical tent. But Paul says that we should no longer live only for that. Putting that first, Matthew 6, 33, put the, the kingdom of God first. Feed the little guy up here that we should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. Next verse. Here's our conduct. How hard is this to do? And yet we're told to feed the little guy and start changing. Therefore, from now on, Paul says, we regard nobody according to the flesh. Nobody. Hi, how you doing? How's the job going? You, you get embroiled in, in politics and all the other things that go on. Don't be involved with that. It's physical. When we died and came back up, we became part of the God family and, and of eventually God's government, which is going to come down here and take over all government. We understand through Romans 13 that, Jesus, that, that God puts governments in place. Who am I to fight it? And I, again, I'm going to say me. I, I don't. You all have to take care of your own, your own lives. But we, need, we, we really need to learn how to look at each one of our brethren in spirit. My neighbor was outside his house this morning, and I walked over to his porch from my porch, because we only live about 30 feet apart, and two brothers in the faith sat down and had a spiritual conversation for about an hour. I really love that, because I'm able to talk cerebrally with my brother in spirit and feed myself and understand iron sharpens iron and is, and is able to bring me up to a better level. Because what, I, what insight I might have might not be the same as what he might have based on what his life has been. But when you start rubbing together those thoughts and, and understanding what's required of a Christian today in this environment, we're only at the beginning, brethren. Things are going to get a lot, lot worse. 
It's now time to strengthen ourselves and buoy ourselves and really feed the Spirit of God that's in us. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are gone. The old life should be gone. Behold, all things are now new. That's the important part. Getting rid of the old and learning how to live a new way. Let's now go over to 2 Timothy 2. Because, let's see. Let me turn back the page. I think I missed a... Da -da 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 -da. Oh, I got to continue in 2 Corinthians. I didn't get far enough. Okay. Going back. Verse 18. Now, all things are of God. If we're living in that new creation, and that's what we're putting first in our life. Yeah, we got to get up and go to work. Yeah, we got to put food on the table. Yeah, you got to do the mundane things, mow the lawn or whatever you do, take the kids to sports. Yes, that's what the tent does. But if we're feeding the new creature in Christ, as we continue to read here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18, now, all things are of God. If we put ourselves in that mindset, that that comes first, who has reconciled us to Christ, reconciled himself through Christ, he has given us, here's our, here's our first ministry, right? Here, here's the first thing that's in our, in our path. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what does that mean? That means that as we live our life, as, as we go about it quietly, not bringing uh, attention to ourselves, just living our life. Something as simple as getting up on Saturday morning and driving off maybe with a suit and tie. It identifies you as somebody different than a Sunday keeper. Not, you know, it's not necessary. Wesley's back there in a shirt. That's perfect. You know? Whatever, I, would, I would just as soon not have this on either <laughs> or this I would be a lot more comfortable but to, to get up and do something that nobody else is doing because everybody else is going to the market they're getting ready to have something for dinner that night whatever the case may be their activities are anything but God's and even though they go to church on Sunday perhaps as soon as they get home out comes a lawnmower it's like uh, is that really keeping the Sabbath Keeping the Sabbath is really identifying and burying deep, deep in the Word and just, just enjoying what it feels like to have a peaceful day. And as we're able, coming to services and bumping elbows, you know, and, and hugging, maybe air hugs now, and talking with our brethren because what does it do? It buoys us. It strengthens us. Those who need to mourn for somebody can mourn together. Those who need to be joyful together can be joyful together. And when we can sing hymns, the hymns are our time to worship God. Those are all things that are different than what society is doing. Same thing with the Holy Days. Same thing with the food laws. All of those things make us different. Not better, different than everybody else. Because we're trying to do what's in this book now verse 19 that is that God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation it's a commission now verse 20 this is the important part now then we are ambassadors for Christ look up the word ambassador do some research on what an ambassador is for a country Especially if you're a foreign country that is of Islamic nature and you have an ambassador over here, they're not readily accepted, but they drive around in limousines with little flags and an escort of cops or soldiers or whatever they have, and they go to and from propagating their nation. Right? Well, guess what? We have the same job title. Maybe we don't have the limousine. Maybe we don't have the soldiers. Maybe we don't have all the accoutrements that they do. But 
as we live our life, we are propagating the nation of God and the kingdom of God. Here's why. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. When you open your mouth, are you going to use a four-letter epithet? New creature wouldn't. And how many times do we get caught up in something stressful and do it? That's not being an ambassador for Christ. And I, I, Again, I put myself first in line for everything I talk about here. We have to start feeding the new creature in order for that new creature to be able to come forward as we do our physical activities. If we're thinking Christian thoughts, if we're in a Christian attitude according to the Beatitudes, the actions that our body does, what we think, what we say, and what we do will be more like an ambassador for Christ than Satan. And the more we feed that little creature the better that gets to the point where we can then start to turn off the effects of Satan because he is the ruler of this age. He is the oppressor of this world. And we who are Christians who believe in God and want to serve God have to turn Satan off in order for God to come to the forward. Now then again, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, I beg you and me on Christ's behalf, be reconciled fully to God, not just partially. Maybe some in the church have the idea that, well, it's just, you know, it's not quite bad enough that I need to really concentrate on this right now. <laughs> That's for you to decide. We're only just beginning to have, you know, the, the uneasiness about us in this society. But when does it get bad enough? What threshold do we have to cross before we go, oh, well, it's now time for me to turn on my little creature. By then, I think it would be too late because we'll be so accustomed to the world and so oppressed by the things that we need and we want and the desires that we have that even though we call ourselves Christians and go to church on Saturday and carry our little Bible in and take notes, it won't be enough. I seriously doubt it. So it's time for me, and this, this is my awakening. This, is a, this summer has been a really... Interesting summer with all the things that have gone on in the in, in our little household. This has been an awakening for me that I need to really start feeding, nurturing the little guy up here that governs the rest of me. So that my body is in subjection to what my God wants me to do to let my light shine. People can see what I'm about and realize, oh, Maybe, maybe not till, you know, the end of the thousand years. Who knows? But they will understand that it's godly, not earthly. And I'm, I'm really at that point of trying to really knuckle down as much as is within me. We implore, your on, we implore you on Christ's behalf, continuing the verse, be reconciled to God, for he, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. So if we declare ourselves as a Christian, we have an obligation and a duty if we're going to succeed and be a member of the kingdom to begin to reconcile not only ourselves to God as the priest would do on the Day of Atonement, but reconcile other people around us and start showing to them and planting seeds of godliness. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteousness of God in him. Okay, so now I think I can turn the page. There we go. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy 2. And verse 1. This follows that theme of being an ambassador. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. Who else, whoever else has a measure of faith that can be identified, Paul is telling Timothy to commit the faithful sayings of the Bible to those people. And we can identify those people if we are searching to see what their spirit is like. There's ways to do it. Do you keep the Sabbath? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you wanting to serve Him? You can start to identify by asking questions to people. You can see their faith. Are they angry all the time? Not faith. Are they peaceful? Do they have moments of mournfulness? Those types of things test the spirits so that we can begin to see who's on a path of redemption and who's on a path to Satan. Commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Again, generation after generation after generation. This has been happening since the apostles went out to start teaching people. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So, ambassadors, soldiers, same venue. We have a master. We serve the master. No one engaged in warfare, and we are in warfare. We've read those scriptures already about being in warfare with Satan because he's the, the roaring lion that is here trying to deceive the world. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of, in other words, you get embroiled in things that take you away from feeding the creature, the godly creature. Not to be embroiled in the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, being a soldier spiritually has a uniform. Let's go to Ephesians 6 and verse 10. And again, we have to apply this spiritually, although it is written physically. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our battle is spiritual. And the little creature up here that has to be fed has to be strong enough to fight the battle that we're going to fight. And are fighting now. Because it's too easy to get embroiled in man's activities thinking man is going to change when man will never change until Christ comes back, more than likely. It's possible. If every man, woman, and child in this country got down on their knees right now and repented and asked God for forgiveness and came to his truth, this nation would spring up and be a mighty fortress for the world. It would be an example, like in Solomon's day for the Israelites. But every man, woman, and child would have to do it. I don't see it happening. Mostly because Satan is in charge and most people are following Satan. Therefore, because that's not going to happen, let's, let's put some armor on that little spiritual guy up there. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be, may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all, having educated yourself, having put yourself in the right attitude and doing the right activities, stand. Stand, therefore, with your waist girded with truth. Here it is. Put your nose in this. Eat it. Feed upon it. Have the breastplate of righteousness. What's righteousness? Doing what we're asked to do. God imputes righteousness to us, just like he did in Abraham when he told Abraham, get up and leave house, your home, and go. Abraham got up and went, and righteousness was imputed to him. We saw it over and over again in the book of Genesis. We read about it in Hebrews 11, that Abraham obeyed faithfully. And that's an example for us. 
shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put the attitude in there that needs to be so that we can be at peace no matter where we are. Paul talked a lot about that. And all the distresses and things that came on in his life. He was content with where he was because he knew he had God on his side and he was going to be with God when the time came. And he's in a, he's in a grave somewhere still waiting. But it will be soon enough, I have a feeling. Above all, take the shield of faith. How strong is our faith, our measure of faith? Not only the one that we brought to this whole ride that we're on, that we brought to the altar, that we brought to the confession of sin, to repentance and baptism and Holy Spirit given to us, but how much more have we grown since? Will we be able to stand? Taking the shield of faith with which we will be able to quench the fiery darts of Satan. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray always in prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You don't sit down, now I lay me down to sleep, pray my soul, the Lord to keep. It's not praying. It's our innermost thoughts, our innermost desires spiritually. The needs that we have to, for God to fulfill so that we can stand who knows where and say the words we need to say to whoever's on the other side of that desk when the time comes. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. In other words, we don't just worry about ourselves. My aunt who died uh, a couple of years ago now, year and a half, would have her minister come over to visit them. They were infirm. Both of them are infirmed. And my, my aunt had died last year. But when the minister would come and visit them, before he left, she would request prayer. And her and her husband and the minister would stand in the middle of the living room, join hands, and, they would and the minister would pray. And when he thought he was finished, about the time he said amen, Aunt Ann would interrupt and say, please pray for so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, so until all of the family had been prayed for. And no doubt, all the members of her congregation got prayed for too. I don't know how long the prayer went, but that's one of the mo most godly people that I've ever known that would do that and have the attitude that, that her and her husband both had. They're both very special people, and I can only hope that God's graciousness will grant them a place in the kingdom. I really can't because I don't measure up to that. Not by a long shot. I have inklings of it. There'll be times when I'm overcome with something and I'll kneel down or I'll sit down and I'll pray. And a lot of times I pray on in the night watches in bed. And I used to pray in the big rig. I used to drive down the highway when I was by myself and it was two or three in the morning. I could have really good prayers looking out that windshield. So there, there's ways we can go about doing this, wearing the uniform, as it were, spiritually, so that it protects our mind from our body doing something that would betray us forever. Helen, uh, my wife, sent me a, pic, uh, a, a text, or uh, she sent me a text with a picture on it that said this, there isn't a mask big enough to protect us from everything going on in this world. We all need the full armor of God. And I think that's very true, especially in these days. We're at a place in time where we can identify things are not good. And it's the first time in, in my life that I could say that. I mean, I, I served in the Vietnam War. Uh, I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff in my life, but nothing like this that is being so guided and so controlled and so maneuvered by somebody somewhere to cause this much angst and trouble in the whole society of the world. So I'm looking at myself going, I need to be stronger. 
And I think we've seen ways to do that. I want to review before I'm done the old and new man because this is a stark contrast. Over in Colossians 3, if you'll turn there, please. We get a, we get a good view in Colossians 3 about carnality versus spirituality. Okay, we'll start in verse 1. And again, this is, this is really talking to Christians. Because although we have been baptized, we still live a physical life. And so, sometimes that old man just pokes itself in there where you don't want it to be. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. If then we were raised with Christ, our new creature, again, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on these things above humanity, not on things of the earth. Here's that, here's that word again, that four-letter word. For you died, again, emphatic, death, in the water. It's as if we drowned and, the water, and, and we stayed there, never to come back up. And your life is now hidden in Christ. In other words, Paul is again saying, the new creature is what we're supposed to be feeding, what we're supposed to be using. Our thoughts, our attitudes, and, our, and the actions of the members of our body. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him. <laughs> Get that. When Christ appears, he's spirit being. When we see him, we will be spirit beings as well. And we'll forever be with him. I mean, it's hard for us to think about that, the thousand years let alone what happens after. But if this comes true for a Christian, what, wherever that Christian has been brought up and raised, it means that eternity is there forever. It means that for a thousand years we will be working hand in hand with the king because we're his family. We're princes and princesses to the, to the king of this earth. And the world. If, if we're here, that thousand years will go by like that. And we're going to have a myriad of things to do. People to teach. Cities to build. Truth to give. Life lessons. Police, maybe. <laughs> Healing, yes. All of those things. For how many ever cities or tribal units, if you want to call it that, little clans that were given. And that number may grow during the thousand years. And however good we do, I think it's a succession. However we do in this life, we're, we're going to be given something in the kingdom. Whatever we do with that in the kingdom, I think we're going to be given it in planets or whatever. Because we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to have the city of Jerusalem. People need something to do. Especially spirit beings. What if? Go start me a planet. Go populate it. Teach those people my law. How many of those would you be able to do? Given eternity. Because we know there's not going to be any, any less. It's always going to be more. The expansion is going to continue throughout eternity. Hard to wrap one's head around without the Spirit of God because it's too far past human consumption, human understanding to really get your mind around. Continuing here. For you died, verse 3, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, because of this, and we, we understand it, living at something else, because of this, therefore, put to death, death your members which are of the earth, earthy, physical, put away fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God will come upon those who are practicing that, even though they call themselves Christians. 
The sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Also put away anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Don't lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created us. If we're feeding the little guy up here in our brain, a lot of this disappears. How many, how many Christians are still angry all the time? How many are never satisfied? If that's the case, it's the wrong attitude to have. The attitude should change. Notice, who there's not going to be Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. We're all going to be the same. Spirit beams. You know, that's, that's a, to me, it's a big success. It really is. Now, character of a new man. If we're feeding the little guy, if we're understanding what the Beatitudes mean for us in our thought processes, here are the actions that we can do that reflect that. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, in other words, this is not something that we had in our physical life. It's something new for the new creature that we're going to put on us. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. See the Beatitudes in that? Attitudes of thinking will make decisions on what we do. Bear with one, bear with one another. Be patient. Put up with the weaknesses that they might have. Forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave us, so we must do. How many times do we who call ourselves Christians and members of the God family get a, a, a burr up underneath the saddle somewhere and decide we're going we're gonna to be mad at somebody forever? It happens. Helen and I both know people in that situation and we try not to be for. Oh my goodness, we try not to be. Because we've seen the result of what happens when you do. Not to say that I'm not tempted once in a while. Even as Christ forgave us, we, we must also forgive. But above all these things, put on love. Not the love you have for your wife when you lay down at night. Not the love for your buddy that you go fishing with. Love that passes all understanding. Love that says you would die for them, just like Christ died for us. Put on love, which is the bond of maturity, perfection. Let the peace of God rule in your mind. Don't be a sometimes thing. You know, after you've had three or four beers and you're half asleep and you sit down in your chair, you're at peace. Be sober and be peaceful. Let the peace of God rule in your mind to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing in psalms and hymns with grace in your minds to the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now there's a new concept for you. Not selfish, selfless. A selfish person is not going to have this attitude of doing all in word or deed. He has his mindset on things he wants to do regardless of what that might be. Somebody who puts Christ first is going to have this in his mind all the time. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father, through him. Okay, just a couple of more verses and I'm done. Philippians 4, 9. This, this verse gets read a lot and we buzz through it. But let's think about what these words say. Because if we're feeding the little guy up here and he's happy, right? What's, what's that little guy going to think about? How much is it going to help squash the ugliness that's around the world? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. What's true? Right here. 
Word of God. Whatever things are noble, Jesus Christ. Whatever things are just. What's the truth? What's right? What's, what's the, the situation bring to us that we can pick out what's right from wrong? Whatever things are pure. Whatever things are lovely. Think about that. What's lovely? A group of people sitting in this auditorium enjoying one another's company, fellowshipping, learning of God. That's lovely, this to me. Being alone and being angry, not so much. Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, positive versus negative, meditate on that. Think about that. The more we do, the more our actions are going to show these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. All right, I'm just about out of time. I'm going to close with uh, Matthew 4. We know this section of scripture is right after Jesus was baptized by John. He goes out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He's tempted by Satan. And over here in verse 8, the last temptation that Satan gives Christ. This will play out for all of us. When you read this, think of yourself. Think of your measure of faith. Again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan said to Christ, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. If we paraphrase that in today's society, what might we hear? Who might we be standing in front of? Beast? False prophet? If you'll bow down and worship that image... I'll give you everything you need. You'll have a nice house. You'll have three cars. You'll have a big screen TV. You'll have a great job. You make a bunch of money. You'll be successful. Right? That's, that's about what it would be, I think. Satan is offering, because of Christ's stature, and, and Satan knew who Christ was and knew that he had everything anyway, he makes him this pitiful little offer. He said to him, all these things I will give you if you bow down and worship me. One day, if we live long enough, if these are truly the last days, we will all face this challenge. Every man, woman, and child alive at that time will face the challenge of Matthew 4, 8, and 9. And here's what Christ said to him, recorded in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13, and I would suggest that after services sometime this afternoon, read Deuteronomy 6. There's a lot more than just this little sentence. Jesus said to Satan, Away with you, get behind me, for it is written. And that's where we have to base our authority, right here in the Bible. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. How big is our measure of faith? Are we feeding it or ignoring it? I think we got time. I'll tell you something very sobering. April 2002, I was happily driving my big rig southbound on US 99 out of Stockton, headed for Merced, California. And a little kink in the road. I'm looking at my mirrors, making sure everything is okay with my rig. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a vehicle coming up beside me. But I could see that it was going to the left. It went off the highway, bounced off the guardrail, and I lost sight of it at that point. I'm driving down the road. That thing came up and did this. My truck went sideways, down an embankment, made a U-turn, and rolled over three sides. It didn't make it back to the wheels. Cab was crushed. 
I was badly injured, and I probably should have died because my son couldn't get back in the truck. When it got towed to the yard, he went down to take some pictures because we needed, we needed some proof for insurance purposes or whatever, and the company was not being very good about taking care of my needs. And he could not get back in the seat where I had been sitting. I kind of feel that there were angel airbags all around me. I was banged up. My head was about this big. Helen didn't recognize me when she got to the hospital because I was so swollen and blood. And I was pretty broken up inside, and I've, I've dealt with those injuries since, and I live with the pain and the scar tissue and all of those things. I could have died that day, and God saved me. And since then, my kids have had children of their own, and I'm a proud grandpa. I've married, I've baptized, and I've buried some people along the way. And God has taken very good care of Helen and I, even through ups and downs. We're, we, facetiously, we, we facetiously say we're homeless, although that is not strictly true, because we do have a very lovely little cabin to, to make our abode. We have wonderful friends beside us that we get to enjoy meals with and, and, and fellowship with. We have brethren both here and out past the camera lens that we know and love and are in touch with from time to time. And life has been good. And it has given me personally enough time to start recognizing shortfalls in my attitudes and in my behavior and my wife will even admit that I'm changing a little, if you really press her. <laughs> there are a few things that have improved along the way. But I do want to ask, as I end this message, how strong is our measure of faith? Are we ready to face what's coming?